lower layer, which is the most active one, is the basal uh, layer. Then in the skin also, we have the skin appendages. So we have the sweat gland, oil glands, and uh, hair follicles. All this can be sourced for uh, benign or malignant uh, trans uh, transformation. However, most of the eyelid tumors are derived from the epidermis and uh, adenexia, not from the dermis or the subcutaneous. Uh, the main goal of this lecture is to diagnose malignant uh, tumor because missing a malignant tumor is, uh, is dangerous. However, missing a benign one is not a big deal. And as a golden rule, whenever you are suspicious, do a biopsy because it's really easy to biopsy these. They are not sensitive structure like retina or uh, iris or etc. Skin is very forgiving if you want to do a biopsy. Uh, as you uh, very aware that we have the several kind of, ba of malignant tumors in the eyelid. The most common one is the basal cell, followed by squamous cell, uh, sebaceous cell, then melanoma. Um, the, main th the main part of the literature is to help you identify the, the feature of malignant uh, process in the eyelid. And all of you know that ulceration is one of the really main finding in a malignant tumor in the eyelid followed by induration, irregularity, tenderness. Mo as you know, most, most of the malignant tumors are non-tender. So tenderness is not a sign of malignancy. Uh, telangiectasia and uh, belly borders, which is a really common finding in basal cell carcinoma. Uh, basal cell carcinoma, as you know, it's uh, the most common one. It's wadah sauti. Okay. Uh, the most common one is forming around 90%, but this is what's in the Western uh, population. It doesn't mean that's true all over the world. So when you say it's 90%, it's taking from the Western population. When you go to Asia and India, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the percentage may, may differ. Uh, it's well known to be associated to uh, UV light damage, uh, especially for the basal layer of the skin. And it's very common in white skin. Uh, and lower eyelid and middle canthus is most commonly affected because it's exposed more to the sunlight. And uh, as we mentioned before, the billy borders with telangiectasia is one of the uh, hallmark of this uh, disease. This is a typical feature you see it in white skin. You see, can see the ulceration, induration, telangiectasia. And you can see destruction. And you can see also. You can see the barely bar uh, borders in this uh, photo. So again, ulceration, induration, irregularity, destruction, non-tenderness, telangiectasia, and barely borders is the sign of malignancy in this patient. And also in this patient, the same thing. We go through ulceration, destruction, barely border, telangiectasia. I think it's very clear in this patient. Uh, and it's, believe me, it's painless. So uh, this is really uh, very characteristic of this disease. This is another patient in the lid margin. In our basal cell carcinoma, what we see here is a little bit different. We tend to see more of pigmented uh, basal cell carcinoma because of our skin pigmentation is more than what, you, what in the uh, Caucasian or the white skin uh, people. So when you see a pigmented lesion here with ulceration, induration, etc., it's most likely still a basal cell carcinoma because our skin is more pigmented. And it's not only here, also in, in Asia, and I'm sorry, in India, in Africa, you see it more pigmented than what you see in the Caucasian. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma often look, look like a basal cell carcinoma, there, so they are really uh, very similar. It can be uh, nodule, undurated, or can be a plaque uh, in, in, in the appearance, and it may be ulcerated again, like the basal cell carcinoma. It may occur in the uh, skin damaged uh, skin, which is typically uh, uh, preceded by actinic uh, keratosis in the exposed uh, area to the sun. Uh, again, it occurs mainly in the fair uh, skin people, especially uh, elderly, but it can happen in younger patients too who are exposed a lot to the uh, s uh, sun damage. It may be seen in the scars, burns, or area of recurrent uh, trauma or after radiation therapy. So radiation therapy, again, is a risk factor for uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Um, as you know, that squamous cell carcinoma is more aggressive compared to basal cell because basal cell is mo mo uh, mainly a local tumor. 
but basically uh, squamous cell it's ca it can spread and uh, squamous cell it's like the neural spread so it likes traveling through uh, the peripheral nerves and go uh, deeper this patient with squamous cell you can see the lesion is small however when you want to get a clear margin with the most surgery it's become really big because what you see in your eye is, is not exactly what the uh, unfolded part of the skin. For example, if you, you see this biopsy, this is after more surgery. So it's, it's really aggressive tumor that need a wider excision compared to uh, basal cell carcinoma. Uh, squamous cell car uh, sebaceous cell carcinoma is uh, um, uh, appearance is not typical for other neoplasm, what we talk about uh, regarding telangiectasia, ulceration, etc. It, it has a growth characteristic with the vegetoid spread and late ulceration and multifocal uh, origin for this tumor. Um, as you know that it may come masquerading other, other problems like uh, chalazion, uh, chronic pilophritis, and uh, also may be associated with the uh, lash loss. This patient with lower lid uh, sebaceous cell carcinoma, and you can see the ulceration, and you can see the chronic redness in the, uh, in the conjunctiva. This patient, again, you can see the uh, involvement of the uh, lid, which is a form of inflammation. And whenever you are in doubt, when, is it a, basal, a sebaceous cell or not, do a biopsy, because it may really mimic bilophritis and even chalazia, especially in elderly patients. In, in, our, in our population and also in Indian uh, population, it can occur in younger patients, like 40 or even 50. It doesn't need to be in elderly like what's in the textbook, so you, you need to expect it in a younger, uh, ancient, uh, younger patient population too in our area. This is again with uh, high magnification. This is, this is a, you can see here, this is an area of uh, sebaceous cell carcinoma. So if you're nearly not sus uh, suspecting this one, you may miss it. And you may treat it as uh, sty or bilifritis for a uh, few months with no response. So really suspicion and biopsy, whenever you are suspicious about the lesion is the should be your, uh, uh, should be your uh, standard of care for these patients. Uh, sebaceous gland can originate from a bony gland, which is the most common source, but can occur, occur from other glands around the uh, eye. A shave biopsy may uh, show only inflammation, so we need to go and take a deeper cut and send that, to, and send that for fat staining. And uh, you need to uh, notify your pathologist that you are looking for spatial cell uh, carcinoma so they can do a special staining to identify this tumor. Uh, local and distant metastases are possible, and this is more aggressive compared to spatial cell or basal cell. And uh, some people, they, um, they do as routine whenever they diagnose a spatial cell carcinoma to do biopsy for the preocular lymph nodes because sebaceous cell carcinoma is known to uh, spread through the lymphatic. So whenever you see a patient with a sebaceous cell carcinoma or you suspect a patient with sebaceous cell carcinoma, you need to, you need to scare, uh, screen for uh, lymphadenopathy because it's really one of the most common modes of spread for this kind of tumor. This is the briefest patient I showed you with the, uh, what looked like uh, lid margin ulceration. And this patient with sebaceous cell carcinoma, and you can see the lymph node involvement in the picture. You can see the breaker in the and an awful submandibular uh, sub, uh, lymph nodes. Uh, pigmented lesion, uh, as you know, the benign feature is uniform color, uh, symmetrical shape, and regular borders. And when you see a pigmented lesion with this feature, it's most likely is a benign pigmented lesion, and don't, you don't need to worry about it. Like this patient, uniform color and uh, not raised and uh, regular. Um, again, uh, not all pigmented lesion are Nephi, so we can get uh, pigmented lesion that they are not Nephi. So we need to be careful. Like we do talk about the basal cell carcinoma in our area can be pigmented, but it's not Nephi. It's a basal cell carcinoma, and not all Nephi are pigmented. Again, so you can see non-pigmented Nephi, and any lesion may be pigmented which is dependent on the skin and the type of the skin. Uh, melanoma is one of the fourth malignant tumor that we, uh, we're gonna talk about. It's, it's really not common in our area, but it's good when in, in, in you have a patient from different area coming for consultation. It's uh, uh, how you recognize it by recent onset uh, or change of the color and shape or size of the pigmented lesion. Uh, multicolored, meaning the not uniformed color, irregular borders or notching, asymmetrical shape, 
large sites more uh, chance for melanoma formation, ulceration or bleeding, and again, biopsy whenever you are suspicious. And you need to, when you biopsy, don't, don't biopsy the margin, biopsy where you think it's most likely gonna be the tumor, for example, nearby ulceration or nearby the change in the color. And this is the area where you hide, where more likely you're gonna uh, tumor uh, cells. You can see this patient with irregular uh, border and you can see the variability in the pigmentation which is very suspicious for uh, uh, melanoma. Uh, this patient again is irregularity. And uh, interesting, melanoma we see it but it's not uncommon. I think last year we saw a patient, I'm not sure who saw him in the clinic with the emergency with us. He came with orbital proptosis in one eye. When we, when we did Minshaf and Shifta, yeah, yeah, it was a Saudi male. He came with a proptosis on one side, and when we scanned the, the image, we found that he has uh, what looked like um, orbital metastasis because of the, of the pattern of the, of the involvement. And he, came, he turned to have melanoma where? In the leg. So when you, when you get a biopsy or you get an orbital uh, metastasis, also you need to think about melanoma coming from elsewhere. So you know melanoma metastasis through the blood, so it go anywhere. Uh, there is something what you call it epithelial trauma, uh, tumors like uh, actinic uh, damage, actinic keratosis, and keratocanthoma. Uh, and there is uh, also epithelial tumors like uh, arcocardin and epithelial, uh, epidermal inclusion cyst, melia, and uh, severe keratosis. Uh, actinic damage is very common in patients that really exposed a lot to the sun, especially with the fair skins. And the sun damage comes with the uh, several feature like metal pigmentation, uh, epidermal atrophy, deep uh, furrows and wrinkles, and uh, uh, rough uh, scaly lips. And this may result to uh, stiffness of the skin and also uh, tumor transformation. Like this is a typical, you can see telangiectasia and also the uh, deep uh, wrinkles and furrows. Uh, actinic keratosis, it's uh, uh, awful erythematous uh, plaques or uh, uh, with the rough uh, adherent white scales to it, associated with actinic uh, skin damage and uh, multiple lesions in the face and the scalp and hands. And all these are sun exposed uh, areas. So this is what uh, where commonly these lesions uh, are uh, arising from. And the early, uh, early lesion may feel uh, gritty, meaning that it's easy to scrape. Uh, uh, and it can be uh, precursors for uh, squamous cell carcinoma, so they need to be treated. And most commonly, the treatment option for this one is a cryotherapy, plus other treatment options we're going to touch on at the end of the lecture. And this is one of the uh, typical uh, uh, finding or clinical finding in the actinic keratosis. Uh, keratocanthoma is a uh, rapidly growing uh, dome-shaped tumors with a central uh, keratin-filled uh, crater. It's rubber growth, meaning in a few weeks, and spontaneous uh, involution, which is the natural history for this one, over a few months. And uh, this can be a probably a, a low-grade squamous cell carcinoma, so it's, it's not a truly benign lesion. So we need to biopsy it whenever we have suspicion, especially taking the biopsy from the base of the keratocanthoma, because the, 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 the upper part of it may be uh, benign, but the base can, can harbor uh, uh, malignant uh, cells. This is a patient with keratocanthoma. This is after excision. Uh, skin tags, it can be a fibroepithelioma, it can be beniculated, and it's common in the eyelid and lick and, uh, and the neck and axilla and the groin. And, there, and also they are multiple with the small, uh, uh, small uh, size uh, lesion, ranging between two, two, two to three millimeters, like this one. Seborrheokeratosis is, a, is a really a common uh, skin changes that we see. It's a keratic plaque with a stuck on appearance, meaning it's just like something attached to the skin, not uh, deeply inf uh, infiltrating the skin. Uh, it can be uh, uh, a different shape and different uh, colors, and also in the thickness, it depends how, uh, how long it was, uh, it, it, it appeared. And um, it can be, uh, you, uh, m single or it can be multiple in different areas. Uh, this is really another common problem, seborrheokeratosis, and uh, and it's a form of uh, benign proliferation of normal epithelial cells in the in the epidermis. And the treatment for this one is just uh, simple shaping and excision. 
this is a what what you look like a stuck on appearance you can see them here just something is attached to the skin directly uh, cutaneous hair is more of a description which is a, a skin color horn like projection of the keratin and uh, it's uh, again it's a descriptive not, not a diagnostic and can arise from different uh, skin uh, pathology like seborrheic keratosis even can arise from basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma uh, this patient is a cutaneous horn and it was rising from uh, basal cell carcinoma and it's very easy to shave and uh, get rid of like what we did here this is the patient after. The squamous papilloma, it's a bendiculated flesh, uh, flesh color tumor, uh, and it's, it's again, it's a descriptive, not a diagnosis, and can arise from a different uh, skin uh, lesions, either benign or malignant, but this is more of a benign uh, lesions. Uh, like this one. Uh, epidermal cyst or inclusion cyst is a whitish uh, dermal or subcutaneous uh, round cyst. It contains uh, cheesy uh, de squamated uh, keratin. And it's not, some people they call it uh, sebaceous cell, while well, the content is keratin, not sebaceous cells. So uh, uh, maybe become infected and rupture and cause inflammation if it's uh, get infected. And uh, you treat it with uh, just uh, opening it with a blade and scrape off the lining. And in other words, it's marcibilization. You can see this one, this is epidermal cyst, it's containing keratin. This is another one. Uh, Melia is a white, a small white uh, epidermal uh, rice uh, kernels. It's a multiple small inclusion cyst filled up with keratin again, but this is a smaller size. It's common in different ages, but more common in newborn. And the treatment if it's just small excision, if it's only few, but if the multiple, it's just just leave them alone, like in this patient. Uh, regarding the pigmented cells, as you know, that melanocytes found in the basal cell uh, layer of the, of the epidermis, and the amount of the pigmentation depends in, in the race and also in the age. As you can see here, the, uh, this is a cut skin uh, section, and this is, you can see the mel uh, melanocytes present here. Uh, uh, melanocytic nephi are pigmented and also can be non-pigmented as we just uh, touched on before. It can be small or large, it can be flat or uh, raised, it depends from one patient to another. And it can be dome-shaped or it can be uh, bulboidal in shape. Pigmented lesion uh, evolve with years, that's meaning uh, with different age group, with different appearance. And they can, can, it can be divided to three types. It's junctional, meaning an early, uh, an early patient or early uh, age, uh, compound in the middle age, and intradermal in, uh, in elderly. And junctional, it comes like an awful uh, round uh, light to dark color, and it's smaller in size. Uh, compound gradually become elevated, and, and this typically in the second uh, decades. And the intradermal is a deeper dome shape, uh, fine skin uh, lined uh, loss in this uh, deep uh, uh, intradermal. And this is more common in the elderly uh, people. And this patient, these patients, most of the pigmented are, uh, are really, um, most of the pigmentation is lost. This to show you, this is a junctional type, which is earlier in, in, in early uh, decades. This is a compound type, is more raised now, and this is in the second decade. And this is an intradermal, which is typically non-pigmented and typically in uh, elderly patient. This is again uh, intradermal uh, lesion. Uh, congenital uh, nephi also can be seen in, in, in the eyelid and uh, typically present at birth. It may have uh, also hair growing through them and maybe large or small depends on the uh, in the pigmented part of the uh, lesion and increase uh, incidence of melanoma with a congenital uh, nephi and can be kissing nephi or giant uh, hairy nephi and the treatment for this in excision if it's possible if it's not possible it's just uh, leave them alone and, and uh, observation this is a congenital nephus this is a kissing nephi 
Um, the eyelid, the skin adenexia, is, uh, as we mentioned before, it can be the, for the hair, oil, oil glands, and the sweat gland. And the hair, a benign adenexial tumor uh, originating from the oil secreting glands, it can be external herdurum, which we know is, is also a sty, which is an acute infection of uh, zeis gland. Internal herdurum, which is originated from a, a meibomia gland, which typically you call a chalazian. Uh, and chalazin is a chronic lipogranulomatous inflammation of meibomian glands. And there is sebaceous hyperplasia, which are arising from oil secreting glands. This is a chalazin. Uh, sebaceous hyperplasia is a small, shiny, yellowish uh, papules with the central uh, amplification uh, seen in the, in the forehead because the area is very uh, intense with the oil secreting glands. And, com and typically ha happen in the patient in the middle age patient. And hyperplastic and hypertrophied uh, epidermal uh, sebaceous gland in this area. And again, it may mimic uh, basal cell carcinoma, so we need to evaluate it. If you are suspicious, you can do a biopsy for this one. And this is what you can see it. It's, uh, it's a central, central application with the hyperplastic uh, oil secreting glands. Uh, benign adenexial tumor is arising from the sweat gland. It can be from exocrine glands or can be from abo abo uh, abocrine glands. The most common one arising from the exocrine gland is the syringoma, which is a, a bilateral small multiple uh, papules commonly in the lower eyelids, especially in women, and it's fleshy colored uh, or yellow. It appears at puber uh, puberty and proliferate uh, uh, at, uh, later on, and benign adenoma of the exocrine gland ducts, it's not uh, from the, the epithelium of the duct, it's epithelium of the gland is mainly from the duct, and it's the most common uh, adenexial tumor because it's really common. The, the, the bottom line is really difficult to treat, and something that we see a lot, and when you see a patient like this, the only treatment we can offer is fractional CO2 laser, which is, again, is not that effective. Why it's difficult to treat? Because of this appearance. You can see it's involving most of the skin in the lower eyelid. So it's difficult to excise, and you, difficult to go piece by piece and excise. So the, the, the treatment that may be offered for them would happen in elderly, but can happen at any age. And it's flesh colored and translucent, uh, but maybe uh, bluish sometimes. And actually, it's an adenoma of the abocrine uh, sweat gland. It's not a true retention cyst. So it's more of a benign tumor than a, a simple retention cyst that we can see in the conjunctiva post-operative. Uh, this is again the uh, hydrocystoma. It's the abocrine hydrocystoma. This is again nearby the punctum. Hair follicles are multiple, but what we see more commonly is the last one, with the, which is the biometric soma, or it's called also calcifying epithelia of uh, malheur. And this is a typical appearance. It become like whitish a little bit with raised, and uh, it can happen at any age. And it happens around the eyelashes. It's also more common happening in the around the the hairs of the brow. The treatment for this one is complete excision. Uh, when you get a skin lesion, the 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 goal for uh, for reaching biopsy for reaching diagnosis is a clinical examination to see if there is any clinical sign of uh, malignancy. And if you are in doubt, you need to do a biopsy to confirm is it benign or malignant. And the biopsy should be, uh, uh, should be done before going to uh, excise a very extensive tumors again. For example, if I know this is a basal cell carcinoma from the feature itself and it's a very big one, it's good to do a biopsy before just to confirm before going to a big excision and reconstruction just to be 100% sure what you are dealing with. Uh, again, if complete excision is bland, a margin should be uh, marked so the pathologist will know which, mar which uh, border is, uh, if there is any malignant tumor left in that border. So you need to orient your biopsy in a, in a way that you can recognize uh, which is the medial, which is the lateral, which is deep, or which is superficial. Uh, biopsy site should be also uh, stitch or photographs. This is very very important for medical legal issue. So before taking any biopsy, take a photo from the original site before biopsy. So this is could most likely a basal cell carcinoma, so you can do a biopsy for this one to confirm your diagnosis. 
Biopsy can be either shaft biopsy, incisional biopsy, or excisional biopsy and closure whenever it's possible. Shaft biopsy is very good for papillomatous lesion, seborrheic keratosis, or nephi, and this is a good example for it. You just shave it and then let it heal by granulation. This is also papillomatous lesion, and you just excise it. This is a, again, it's a, a nephus, uh, and you can just excise it. Uh, uh, for cystic lesion, it's good to do marsipalization or a closure if you are, uh, it's, not if it's not easy to do a marsipalization. This patient with uh, epidermal cyst, this is a marsipalization. You just let it go and uh, granulate. And to, this patient with the cyst that's been excised and skin closed over it. Uh, bunch biopsy, you can, it's another uh, way of biopsy the lesion. And you, you, you make sure that you get, the, or you, you biopsy that the area that really highly suspicious. Try not to go to the margin and miss the tumor. So when the area that is really highly suspicious should be the area where you do a bunching uh, for, for getting a biopsy. Like in this patient, you see the deep color with the light color, you, bu you bunch in that uh, area. Excisional biopsy for a big lesion, you need to do excisional biopsy to make sure that you excise it. And the best way of doing this is, especially in an area that commonly, or patient commonly having a basal cell carcinoma, is to do a MOS surgery. MOS surgery helps preserving the tissue so you can excise only the affected tissue. And also, it, it's done in multiple sessions. So they excise and make sure the margin are okay. If they are not okay, they take a little bit more piece in the involved part, so they keep going till they get the whole uh, margins are clear. When you get the tumor uh, excised, especially for the eyelid, we need to do a, a reconstruction. And uh, and before doing a reconstruction, we need to uh, uh, recognize the main pillars of the eyelid. So we have the anterior lamella, posterior lamella, lid margin, lateral canthus, and medial canthus. So we need to keep in mind reconstructing the eyelid with these pillars uh, are uh, maintained. Uh, again, before going to reconstruction, you need to uh, size the defect and also need to uh, determine which tissue being involved. Is it anterior lamella or posterior lamella? And also, uh, uh, you need to evaluate the tissue available. If there is canaliculus involvement of, or there is a, a levator muscle involvement, so you need to know which tissue are missing and which tissue is available. Uh, for eyelid reconstruction, we can do uh, different options, either uh, direct uh, closure of the small defect, skin graft is a big defect in the atir lamella, and also you need to keep in mind the uh, lacrimal reconstruction if you are dealing with a medial canthal uh, area defect, or also you can do uh, tissue flaps depending on the size and location. If the defect is small, less than 25%, you can do primary closure with the lid margin repair and plus minus uh, lateral tarsus strip whenever it's rendered. Like this patient, a small defect, you can do just direct closure. It's really important when you do a direct closure, this one is to, m to close from, from this direction to this direction. So the, the, the bull or the tension will be in this direction, not in this direction, because if you keep it in this direction, the patient will end up with Ectrobian, okay. Uh, this is again a patient with uh, which uh, resection with just direct closure with uh, aligning the lid margin. Uh, this is another patient, yeah, the same patient with lid closure. This is again another patient with lid closure, direct, because this defect is small. So the other option, if the direct closure cannot be achieved, we can go for skin graft. And this patient with the, uh, with a big defect in the uh, brow, this is uh, after skin graft. Also here you can do flaps too, so it's not only graft, but graft is one of the options. Also this patient with defect in the lower lid with a skin graft. This patient with the big defect in the upper lid with a skin graft. You can see the anterior posterior lamella is intact, so we can do skin grafting, but if the posterior lamella is not intact, you need to reconstruct the posterior lamella with other options we're gonna touch on. And this is, in the white skin, the skin graft here is way better than our skin, so our skin, skin graft should not be the first choice. So we need to go with the flaps and other options first before going thinking about skin graft. 
If the defect is between 25 and 50 percent, we can do canthotomy cantholysis with lead margin repair, and also you can do a tensile flap. This patient with around 50 uh, percent defect, and uh, the way to close it, you do canthotomy cantholysis with uh, canthotomy with inferior cantholysis, so we can mobilize the skin. If it doesn't come with you all the way, the lead margin, you can combine it with the tensile flap. This is the appearance of tensile flap here. You can extend it so we can rotate the skin more. This is just with canthotomy cantholysis, the, skin, the defect was possible to close. This patient with a big defect, and this one we need to do flaps whenever possible, as we talked before. The flaps is better than graft because the flap it has on blood uh, supply, so the survival, also the texture of the skin, the uh, the the, the maintain the, the shape itself, it will be way better. So whenever you have a choice between graft or flap, always take flap. Uh, Flaps again provide blood supply, list contracture, uh, locally uh, fillable tissue will be best match for the defect, and less chance for infection, and excellent color and texture match. If the defect between uh, 50 to 100 percent, we need to do more uh, manipulas mobilization and also tricks to get the defect closed. So we can use canthotomy cantholysis along with lead margin uh, repair, tensile flab, use flab, and catabid flab, or other options that we're going to touch on. So this is a big defect in the lower lid, and the, the option for treatment this one, we need to reconstruct the posterior lamella, and also the anterior lamella, because most uh, both are missing. And to reconstruct the anterior lamella, we, uh, I mean, sorry, the posterior lamella, you can borrow a tarsus from the upper flap, which you call it use flap. Then you lower it down and attach it to the remaining part of the eyelid in the lower lid. Then after that, you can do advancement uh, flap to cover the, uh, the eyelid. If you cannot do the advancement flap, you can do skin graft. But you cannot do graft over graft. You can do graft over flap, but not graft over graft, okay? And this is again another uh, use flap here and reconstruct the lower lid. A use flap is done really way common because most of the basal cell carcinoma are happening in the lower lid. And, th and you can divide the flap three weeks after, up to six weeks, depends from uh, one surgeon to another. But after three weeks, it will be uh, really healed up and you can divide it. Uh, glabular flaps, especially if you are dealing with a me medial canthal area uh, defect, like in this patient, and you can just move a uh, glabular flap. There are different ways of reconstructing the medial canthal area. You can st you can use a bilobial flap and also a sliding flap. There's different techniques for it. This patient with the glabular flap. If the defect is bigger, you can go for uh, medium forehead flap, so you unfold more dissection and, and burrowing more uh, tissue to cover the defect, like in this patient. If it's so big, you need to have a bigger flap, and this can extend to the scalp too. Uh, also, the defect in the lower cheek, you can do a uh, master the cheek flap if you are really want to have a bigger uh, mobilization of the tissue. So you, you need to have really good anatomy of facial nerve in this area because when you want to do dissection in this area, you will face most of the facial nerve uh, branches. So uh, the patient will uh, looking for better cosmesis not to have the sequelae of facial nerve palsy. This is a patient with uh, mustard cheek flap, and you can do after dissection and mobilization of the flap. If the upper lid is missing, so you can use a cutter bird uh, procedure where you can borrow a tissue from the lower lid and reconstruct in the upper lid. Uh, in the cutter bead flap, we get a, a posterior lamella as a graft, and you get the anterior lamella as a flap from the lower lid. It's opposite than he was a flab. He was flab, you get the posterior lamella as a flab from the upper lid, and you get the anterior lamella as a flab or the as skinny graft. Okay, um, uh, as you know, the main, the main treatment or the gold, gold standard treatment for basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma is surgical excision. 
However, there are other options you can use, especially for a small one that is not high risk. Uh, one of the options you can use is a cryotherapy. You can use a BDT for, uh, for, skin, uh, for skin tumors. Uh, local chemotherapy also can be used, like in form of 5-FU, and also bilomycin have been used with a good success. You can use immune response uh, modifier, uh, especially uh, like uh, uh, Amiogimod, which is called Aldera. It's really commonly used by dermatologists now. Also, you can inject interferon that helps shrinking these tumors. Uh, there are also other options that you can use for patients who, had, uh, who have uh, non-resectable non uh, basal cell carcinoma. Uh, can also respond to some uh, systemic uh, uh, chemotherapy. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yeah, it can check it with the, because here we don't do a lot. We we don't have more surgery, so we check it with the frozen section. So when you when you have a basal cell carcinoma that is a big size, a little bit, you need to notify your pathologist before, so they will be prepared for frozen section. But if you are doing a smaller size basal cell, you can you can excise it with the what you call the clear margin, like two millimeter to three millimeter of what look like normal uh, margin. If you are dealing with a basal cell carcinoma. If it's squamous cell carcinoma, sebaceous cell carcinoma, uh, squamous cell can, can do well with the frozen section, but sebaceous cell doesn't do well with the frozen section. Question? Uh, well, this is the area of controversy. Do you do map, uh, map biopsy or not? Some people, they do 8, some people, they do 12. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of these. I've seen maybe like 3 or 4. These I did map biopsy from the bulbar conjunctiva, also from the uh, bulbar conjunctiva. All biopsy came to be negative. But uh, still it's the area of controversy. Even if you read the recent literature, still an area of controversy. Which area to biopsy? Do we still need to go with the map biopsy or it's just a historical practice, people are not in agreement on this. I'm not sure what Dr. Diego is doing for sebaceous cell. Do you do a map biopsy? How many do you do? 12, 8, or? Second. Ah, okay. I'm going to give you the reasons here. It's better to provide the blood supply, less contractures, better skin match. And also our graft, because our skin is pigmented, the color match will be uh, more than the fair uh, uh, skin people. that all the uh, young oculoplastic uh, surgeons should be in, know very well because there are some other school, I mean, other tradition that they insist with the graft. Uh, and I, I totally agree. It's not only, to me, it's not, uh, not only a matter of uh, cosmetic or, as you said, it's, uh, but the most important thing is the blood supply. And also, in some way, I mean, probably it's... Uh, it's uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not a, a, a demo, I mean, there is no study showing this. But 
there are some theory, I, sometimes I discuss it also the oncology. When you reconstruct with the flaps, you anyway bring fresh lymphocytes, fresh immunocells that are not nowadays, there is the Nobel Prize last year, we know that it's are crucial for you know, oncological treatment. So, I mean, even for the local control, I don't know, there are no study about that, but I think bringing flap and bringing normal cells and bringing immunocell, fresh immunocell, rather than like a dead cells that you get with the graft is much better, even, I mean, in long-term control of the disease. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much.
Uh, we'll be uh, starting soon if you want to call your uh, colleagues. <coughs> so I'll be presenting uh, Dr. Noor Al Khareji. Uh, she's a consultant of anterior segment uh, refractive surgery and uveitis division at King Abdelaziz University Hospital, King Saud uh, University, an active member in the uh, clinical and research. Uh, load in the university. The topic uh, presented is stem cells um, for regenerative therapy uh, in the cornea is one of the challenging therapy modalities, uh, but is in high uh, demand and uh, need. Please, uh, Dr. Anur. Thank you, Dr. Fajwa. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, stem cells for the cornea. It's quite a wide topic and um, still ongoing, many research is going on, but uh, the need for uh, stem cell therapy and regenerative therapy of the cornea is increased demand, especially in our society where we encounter lots of cases uh, where uh, we need to address their ocular surface. A stem cell. So what is a stem cell? Basically, it is a cell that can divide indefinite periods of time in a cultural plate, providing you provide it with the optimum uh, nutritional and uh, environmental conditions, and can give rise to specialized cell. So muscle cells, blood cells, neuronal cells, cardiac cells can all originate from stem cells. There are two specific characteristics or important characteristics that define a stem cell. The first is that the stem cell, which is an unspecialized cell, is capable of renewing themselves through cellular divisions, and sometimes after long periods of inactivity. This is the first trait for a stem cell. The second is that under certain conditions, they can be induced to be tissue or organ specific that perform specific functions. The two stem cell types that we are dealing with in the lab are adult stem cells, or are also known as somatic stem cells, and there are also embryonal or embryonic stem cells. An adult stem cell, or a somatic stem cell, basically what is the cell? It's a cell type that usually resides in a specific tissue and then it will give cells of that particular tissue. This particular statement has caused lots of debate and controversy, and we will see why later on. So if we have hematopoietic stem cells, they give to the uh, long line of uh, blood cells, whether they are RBCs, B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, neutrophils, mesenchymal stem cells, they can, those that originate from the bone marrow, give rise to bone marrow, stromal stem cells, skeletal stem cells, um, bone cells such as osteoblasts, osteocytes, adipocytes, neuronal stem cells give either rise to neurons or non-neuronal cells, such as the oligodendrocytes, epithelial stem cell in many areas give rise to specific cells in that tissue area. We have skin stem cell as well, especially in the basal layer, and we have hair follicular stem cell, and this is uh, of particular importance. We will know why later. So you can see here. You don't, okay. So you can see here. So this is the area where usually stem cells reside. They are inactive unless there is a wound or lesions that um, activate them in order to heal and repair that wound area. Um, and it can give rise, of course, to the hair follicle and the uh, cells around it, as well as we will see later, other forms of cells. The difficulty with adult stem cell is that usually these cells, they are small in number in each tissue. And once you remove them from the body and place them into an, ex an external environment in the culture plates, the capacity to divide becomes quite limited. And when we are dealing with these, these kind of cells, we are needing large quantities of adult, adult stem cells. So this is, um, this is a challenge. So even um, cells that produce type 1 insulin um, 
are being in progress, and this is a big part of cell uh, therapy, especially for patients who have type 1 diabetes. An embryonic stem cell. So what is this type of cell? This stem cell is actually taken from a pre-implantation stage embryo into a plastic laboratory culture dish, and then many cell layers. So not like the adult stem cell where you have a specific layer uh, of cells that can be produced. So all the three la layers of cells uh, can be, so they, uh, whether they are ectoderm or uh, the other uh, two layers, can be produced from this type of cell. The problem with the embryonic uh, stem cell is that uh, there are many uh, issues when uh, trying to uh, cultivate these cells and get them to grow um, on many different levels, and sometimes there are issues, especially uh, within uh, the laboratory component of these cells. So why is stem cell therapy quite relevant? The concept and the idea that you are able to regenerate or repair a, an injured tissue that is otherwise unrepairable or severely injured is quite exciting, and researchers and laboratories have really focused lots of energy on this kind of modality, um, especially that we are now able, or it has been able, to transplant adult stem cells in different particular tissue with very promising results. And the adult stem cells, one of the um, good things about it, uh, that they found that it has the potential to develop into different cell types in the body, regardless of where that actually, the, origin, the original tissue resides. In many tissue, they serve as a sort of internal repair system. This, function, uh, this functional capacity of the adult stem cell can be used in a different type of tissue. So this is uh, quite promising. So when the stem cell starts to divide, it has the potential of either becoming another stem cell or becoming more specific into a specialized functional cell, whether it's a muscle cell, cardiac cell, or brain cell. Let's talk a little bit more about corneal stem cells. First of all, the stem cell-based therapy, it's, it represents a novel strategy in the cornea. And the idea behind it, or the, uh, the main promising factor in it, is that it may substitute or aid in conventional corneal transplantation. Albeit, there has to be, or there are challenges ahead, given that each corneal layer has a different type of cellular architecture. Okay, so different cellular layer of the cornea have different response to the stem cell or different components of stem cells. So first of all, the corneal limbal autografts that contain the epithelial stem cell, which we all know and we talk about and we, um, we see a lot, these have been transplanted in the human eyes for more than 20 years with relatively great success. The focus now is on the ex vivo cultures of these cells and the other cell lineages to transplant to the ocular surface. So recently, it has been reported there is a, that there is a small proportion or population of cells, of corneal endothelial cells, that have a self-renewal capacity, although they do not proliferate in vivo. The main two issues with the endothelial cell is with the culture protocols that may damage these cells, and another issue also is the cell delivery methods to the posterior cornea. Another quite uh, promising uh, aspect of this is that also when the endothelial cell precursors have been identified, they also found that human corneal stromal cell cells have been identified shortly after. So you can see here, in the co-culture plate, you can see a group of stromal cell cells in this area as well as here with the 3D plate. So to date, the main utilization of the limbal stem cell was for ocular surface and is still for ocular surface disease, at least from a practical point of view. The other newer therapeutic strategies are still under development, whether we are talking about the stromal cell cells 
or the corneal endothelial cell precursors or progenitors. Regenerative medicine of the cornea represents a novel treatment, as we mentioned, and the cellular therapies are challenging because of the singularities of each cellular layer. So we have the epithelium, and then we address the stroma, and then the endothelium. And uh, many uh, reports and studies of limbal stem cell transplantation have followed, especially when we're, we are talking about uh, heterologous donors and ex vivo culturing of the cells. So one by one, if we take the corneal epithelial layer, the corneal epithelium is formed of a stratified, non-cretinized, squamous form of epithelium that spreads over the corneal surface from limbus to limbus. The epithelial cells in a normal status is regularly shed off the surface and replaced by new epithelial cells that are provided by the stem cells that are located at the uh, limbal area uh, at the peripheral cornea. So this is usually where the stem cells, the limbal stem cells reside. And as they proliferate, they head towards the center. And as they differentiate, they head upwards toward the squamous cells. And this turnover in a normal status is from seven to 10 days. And it is accelerated if you have trauma or injury to the cornea, epithelial cornea. So there is a disease we all know very well. It is limbal stem cell deficiency. There are so many causes for limbal stem cell deficiency, whether the issue is affecting the limbal stem cell or the niche destruction. So the niche is the, the spot or the location or the home where the stem cell reside. So it could be something hereditary like an iridia, could be related to trauma, chronic contact lens use, chemical injury, multiple surgery, radiation, anti-metabolite, uh, anti-glucoma use, more and ulcer infection, keratitis, vitamin A deficiency. So there is a long list of cases that can cause limbal stem cell deficiency. When we are diagnosing, diagnosing this particular uh, disease, first of all, we need to start with the history. History by looking back to this patient and seeing what is, how did the insult occur? So is it a contact lens? Is the patient on chronic anti-glucoma use? Did he have multiple procedures? So all of this, you can take it from the history. And then you go to slit lamp examination, and then if you have any ancillary testing, you can add that. So slit lamp examination, the first thing is that you will see a dull, regular reflex that is representing the conjunctival conjunctivalized corneal surface. And if you examine the limbal area, you will find that there is loss of limbal palisades of Vogt. If you put fluorescein and wait for five minutes, you will find the classic waterfall or whirls of epithelium. This is very characteristic of this one. You see it? This is very characteristic of stromal stem cell, sorry, uh, of stem cell deficiency. And you can see here in this figure, there are um, how the cornea is affected from the normal status uh, and how it is affected in the mild, moderate, and severe cases of limbal stem cell deficiency. So you can see in uh, the first line, you can see that the coronary clarity is nice and good. Staining of the fluorescein, not, there is no staining. And you can see by confocal that the cellular and tissue arrangement is quite normal. As you go to mild form of destruction, you can see you have some staining here of the epithelium. Okay, indicating partial limbal stem cell deficiency and localized. And as you, go, you see here, you can see that there are some cysts and some uh, disregularization in, the, in this area under the epithelium. As you go to moderate and severe, you can see how the corneal haze is starting to form and the whirls in this area. And you can see the conjunctivalized cornea in this area. And when you see the confocal microscopy, you can see that there is loss of lots of the epithelial cell, especially here, lots of cyst formation, loss of the epithelial structure. One of the main uh, complaints that these patients also have is recurrent epithelial defects. Um, in a series, the most common signs were epithelial haze, uh, superficial vascularization and panis formation and conjunctivalization. Stromal scarring starts to occur as the uh, surface epithelium becomes abnormal uh, and the conjunctiva starts to encroach in that area. And then you find these patients complaining of chronic conjunctival hyperemia.
And then we can go to the ancillary testing after you have completed your examination. So one important test is corneal impression cytology. So what is done in this particular test is you take a cellulose, acetate paper, and you just apply it to the surface of the cornea, and you remove it. And then you send it for histological analysis. Usually what you can see in cases of limbic stem cell deficiency is that there is goblet cells, indicative of